Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Scott Marks, and I'm a program manager for the Recycling Market Center, and I will serve as the moderator today. Today's webinar topic is Advancing Circular Economies in Plastics. Plastics are a regenerating hydrocarbon reserve. Our presenter today is Dr. Christopher Faulkner, whom I will introduce in a moment. Following his presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A feature box located on the control panel on your screen. You may also use the chat feature to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center's websites. Also note that the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center, its affiliates and funders, and the National Recycling Coalition assume no liability resulting from the use of any information provided during the webinar. The webinar is only provided as an informational tool and no discrimination is attended and no endorsement by these organizations is implied. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Faulkner brings over 14 years of technical and organizational expertise on the engineering process, analytics, and administrative fronts to deliver products and operating assets. He has held engineering, scientist, and management positions in the renewable energy and chemical industry sectors with a focus on sustainability and stewardship. Dr. Faulkner has a proven track record of commercializing innovations and successful project management. He is an inventor of novel polymer composite materials and has led the certification and commercialization of the international product launch of a five kilowatt combined heat and power fuel cell system. Dr. Faulkner brings technical commercialization, innovation, project management, and business acumen to the advancement of the Agilix Solutions Platform of Superior Materials Management and Chemical Recycling. Dr. Faulkner holds a doctorate in chemical engineering from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Faulkner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. Uh, first, I want to thank you and uh, the National Recycling Coalition, as well as Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center for this opportunity. Uh, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be able to discuss uh, materials management, especially on the plastics front uh, with folks at large. And I hope that uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, well worth your time and insightful and give you some uh, interesting perspective of how uh, both I myself and Agilix views uh, plastics and the, the role of post-use plastics. So I'll give the punchline up front. Uh, it's already in the title as you see it on the screen. Uh, we fundamentally view uh, plastics as regenerating hydrocarbon reserve and we'll speak about that throughout the rest of the, the webinar today of what that means and how that really drives circularity and supply chains and economies, and enables the recovery of more plastics at large. Uh, so with that, we'll start with, uh, with a common ground. I think uh, most folks uh, uh, that are participating today are familiar with this, but uh, we're reaching up into the mid 300 million tons of plastics produced globally each year. And it's ubiquitous in our lives from safety to pharma, life sciences, packaging, uh, automotive, and whatnot and uh, the trend just keeps going up and up and how much we have been able to innovate as a, as a society of using plastics in our culture and in our industries and uh, just uh, seeing that at large um, and the unfortunate reality is even though this material has been around for quite a long time uh, we have not done a good job culturally as society as as well as industry and uh, municipal governments as well of recovering this material uh, after it's been used. And so uh, we're really at all the plastics that have been produced, 10% uh, or less have been ever recovered and recycled. Um, and we're starting to see the environmental impacts of that in our, in our world. As discussed, uh, you know, plastics are continuing to grow as economies are, are growing around the world and uh, other, other societies such as Asia, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and Africa and South America are, are uh, catching up in the industrial scale. Uh, plastics are continuing to project it to grow at 9% and even double in the next uh, 30 years in, in use and production. So 
in order to catch up, uh, not only do we need some uh, significant change in how we're viewing recycling and what we're able to do with plastics, but we're going to have to advance very quickly uh, to catch up with the expected production uh, as we go forward. So uh, we discussed various sectors of where uh, plastics are used. Uh, predominantly uh, for, for us, uh, we mainly see that plastics are used in packaging. And that's uh, true, um, as you can see by the figure on the screen. Uh, nearly half of the materials of plastics are used in the packaging industry. Uh, we have fabrics and textiles and other products as well. Uh, plastics have even been uh, one of the primary indicators of uh, lightweighting uh, transportation vehicles and reducing uh, uh, fuel consumption and uh, carbon impact by the automotive industry. But still, uh, we're, we're continuing to use plastics more and more, uh, especially in packaging, uh, as we see. And that's what most of us uh, handle day in and day out. So where does all this plastics go? Unfortunately, as uh, previously mentioned, uh, most of it is discarded uh, directly to landfill. Uh, some of it is used for energy recovery. Um, and uh, some, you know, a good percentage is still in use, but even durable goods uh, will have an end of life and we'll need to figure out a solution of what to do with those materials. We do some and we've been making some progress on recycling and recovering of plastic, but uh, out of all the plastics produced, you know, we're nearly 8 billion tons since 1950, only 6% were captured and even then after the recycled and reused in the market, uh, they end up being discarded or incinerated after their second, third, or fourth life. So it's a big issue uh, and something that many people are focused on today, especially in the past three years. Uh, we've seen an incredible amount of attention given to plastics and post-use plastics, what to do with them. So here at Agilex, uh, we have a, our mission is to dramatically increase plastic recycling from around that 10% number uh, to greater than 90%. And so for the first part of this webinar, I'm going to focus on why our current plastic recycling rates are so low, uh, including the complex chemistry that, of what plastics are, uh, the variability in waste streams uh, that adds to that complexity, uh, how historically uh, our recycling has demanded high quality feedstocks for good reason, and uh, what that does, uh, and how that impacts recycling markets from our viewpoint, and then how new supply chains are needed if we're going to actually aim to increase those recycling rates dramatically to above 90%. So let's start uh, with the, the complex chemistry of what plastics are and why that's uh, keeping our recycling rates low. So in order to actually increase that, uh, our, our viewpoint is that we need to fundamentally understand post-use plastics. Um, and I'll get into Agilex's history later as a, as a, a case um, of this principle. But first, plastics, uh, by their very nature, they're a picture of complexity. Uh, in fact, I've been using the word plastic, but uh, there's, that encompasses a wide range of materials. Uh, and there's quite a few chemical substrates, and there are many, many uses we discussed previously to too numerous for me to uh, rattle on on this, this webinar for, but uh, it's quite a complex uh, material. In fact, just using the common nomenclature or the common names for plastics, there's 22 different types of polymers that we can say are common plastics. Uh, so we're already starting at, from a wide array of materials. Uh, there are two primary uh, sets of plastics. There's thermoplastics and thermosets. For those that are familiar, thermoplastics are those that can be melted and, and uh, heated to be reformed and reused again um, and can be what somewhat pliable uh, through processing. Thermosets, once those plastics are made, they basically are, are frozen in time and you cannot uh, use processing means to reuse those materials. And so there's a combination of just even in plastics, those that you can recycle easy through heating mechanisms or, or whatnot, and those that 
will require other means uh, to reprocess. So we're starting with a base of 22 different types of materials that we call plastic, and then we have to figure out what to do with those. But that's just the start. Uh, you know, plastics are pretty pure when they're, when they're made uh, in their virgin state, but then when we actually move them into making products, uh, it becomes quite complex really quickly. Uh, so you can see uh, we use stabilizers uh, in order to make them more uh, robust in our environment, whether that's through UV, UV degradation, uh, plasticizers so we can actually move the, the polymers around to make the, the products we want, clarifying agents for color and clarity and, and advertising purposes, flame retardants and additional properties so we can use them in applications such as construction or automotive or electronics so we can make our uh, products more safe. And then all of your uh, uh, pigments, dyes, fillers to add uh, other uh, variations to the material so we can get all the products and the properties that we want. Just a, a, a spackling to name a few. And then we have various forms that plastics can be, be shaped into, whether it's a foam, a film, or a rigid. And all these adds to the compounding complexity of what the end material actually starts to look like. I did a thought experiment uh, a few years ago to see how many combinations of polymers and plastics and additives and chemicals that we would actually generate through just the base polymer itself things we add to, to the plastics for making our products, the forms that we then put them in, and then the ways we can recycle them or use them after they've been had their useful life in the world. And you quickly get to over a trillion combinations of different products that can be made in a recycling effort uh, through, through all of these um, combinations, which is quite staggering. So, this complexity adds to why our recycling rates are so low uh, currently because the amount of different variety of materials with the one name plastic is quite staggering. And then we didn't even talk about what's actually the plastics are used for. We, we recall that 140 million plus tons are used for packaging and that means, you know, either product is being put into the plastic containers or products, or they are coming into contact with, with various things, whether it's chemicals, cleaning agents, um, medicines, pharmaceuticals, uh, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, all those are, are products that, you know, residuals come along with the plastics and need to be dealt with if we're going to reuse those plastics again. Uh, on the screen, you'll see just a, a, a few uh, 12 or so uh, types of material streams. This is not all that we have looked at in our company, but you can see a wide range of all the dirt and the fiber, cellulose, metal uh, that comes with post-use polymers and plastics in order for us to, to recycle them again. And in, in some instances, you'll see over a thousand unique compounds on, a, on the chemistry level for what is in a single source of, of post-use. So, uh, as you can see uh, from past few slides, what I'm painting is a picture of post-use polymers and post-use plastics are quite complex, and it's adding to the, to the issue of us trying to recycle and recover these in a succinct and uh, simple manner. So, when we want to reuse these again, uh, traditionally, this variable variability and complexity of the, the polymers and even the unknown composition of what could be coming along with them has made it uh, pretty tough to, to recycle. I'll go into the, the remainder of the slide uh, later, but uh, you know, that's the crux of, of what we view has been limiting us in the past. I want to pause there and then and, uh, and discuss uh, some of the, these terms here. Uh, homogeneous and, and heterogeneous uh, nature of things. Um, and then I'll tie that back into to how we view plastics as a hydrocarbon reserve and the implications of, of these terms. So homogeneous is 
is when something is of the same or similar kind or nature. It's uniform in structure or composition. I like to use food as an illustration because uh, I like to eat and whatnot. So uh, the figures on the left, he has uh, a couple examples of homogeneous M&Ms. So I got this, these images from M&Ms website. You can personalize M&Ms and whatnot. But you can see in the top figure, uh, the M&Ms are all the same shape. They're all the same size. They're all the same color. And they're also all made of the same material, chocolate uh, with, a, with a candy hard-coated shell. Uh, the bottom picture is just a different color, uh, but it's still also uh, homogeneous in nature. So everything is the same. It's uniform, uh, both in its structure, composition, look, and feel. Heterogeneous mixtures, on the other hand, they're composed of different constituents, dissimilar components. Or they're non-uniform in composition. The top right uh, has uh, you know, categorically both homogeneous features and, and heterogeneous. Uh, I've changed a few of the colors of the M&M. &M. Uh, so we, we start to get some you know, different composition of, of color, but they are still the same shape, same size, and the same composition a chocolate with a hard coating shell. The bottom right picture, on the other hand, you start to get a more feel for a true heterogeneous mixture. You know, we've added some, some fruit and nuts uh, along with the M&Ms, so you have different sizes, different shapes, different compositions of, of food. But it is still homogeneous in that it is all food, all that is edible except for the spoon itself but you can kind of get to a feel of what, what a heterogeneous mixture uh, starts to look like. And in post these polymers, the complexity and the heterogeneous nature starts to look more and more and even more complex than the figure on the bottom right. So uh, when we started this discussion of looking at all the different types of plastics, uh, we saw that you know we have 22 common plastics and they're very pure to begin with. So a brief history from plastics from oil, it's been estimated that we have about 3.7 million oil and gas wells that have been drilled in the U.S. alone uh, between 1859 and 2014. All those disparate sources of crude oil from the ground and gas from the ground have been refined and formed to make very similar, very pure products so we can use them. So we've taken very uh, heterogeneous sources of oil and gas, and then made large processes and in infrastructure in order to break all those down, clean them up in very sophisticated fashion in order to produce hydrocarbon products. And in the last 50, 60 years, uh, even 100, almost 100 years for some of the uh, more commodity plastics, only about 4% of the petrochem that's been, been uh, gathered and collected is actually used for plastics and chemicals production. And you have some uh, slip streams in the middle of, of this typical refinery diagram that you can find uh, through the DOE website or, or other resources as well. But just shows you the complex nature of the infrastructure and the lengths at which we go to clean our raw materials to make them very pure for our current uses today. We actually tried to do a similar thing uh, for traditional recycling and post-use um, plastics recovery. So we have a linear ecosystem for hydrocarbon manipulation and producing the plastics to begin with. And we have another linear ecosystem for reusing those plastics in our material management today. But throughout the life cycle of plastics, as discussed previously, we introduced this, this chemical complexity um, and heterogeneity. So not only in the product manufacturing, but in produce, you know, the product consumption, and then in the disposal of it, uh, we cross-contaminate the plastics with other materials. Um, and it, it wides range, you know, that if a wide variety of, of the cross-contamination, whether it be pigments, dyes, additives, the performance enhancers, fillers, which is carbon, um, for like tires and whatnot, uh, processing aids so you can actually release the products when you make them, the putrescibles, which is your food and, and whatnot, and organic materials, biopromoters, inhibitors, 
uh, surfactants, salt. The list goes on and on. Since plastics are ubiquitous in our society, the amount of cross-contamination that we get is, is exponential. But historically, what we aim to do is clean all that up so we can get back to our original pure state so we can use those materials again. And so uh, I believe most of us are familiar with this diagram of plastics materials management. Uh, Boston Consultancy Group reissued this in one of their more recent reports. Um, and again, we're trying to get those plastics out of the landfill or incineration, definitely out of our environment, back into to more recycling, uh, whether that be mechanical in nature or chemical in nature, which we'll discuss further on on what that can mean. But the goal of everyone, I believe, is the highest and best use of materials. And we can debate what that means, but I think that is what the highest uh, and best use uh, and goal is, is for folks in the recycling and materials management industry. The closed loop uh, recently issued a report last summer or last April uh, regarding some of these more circular loops and trying to uh, say what recycling is and how much energy and whatnot it's taking into. So mechanical recycling is a, is a recycling loop, more circular, where you're just taking the material, cleaning it up, and putting it back into use. Unfortunately, often that includes uh, mostly downcycling uh, for what those products are used for. You also have depolymerization of polymers, so that's breaking of the chains and getting them back into what they were made to, to begin with so those plastics and polymers can be used for any source or any potential use uh, for which they're applicable. And then uh, you have a, not necessarily a more circular loop, but actually an energy recovery operation uh, where you're taking the hydrocarbon that those plastics are made out of and using them for energy. Okay. So back to the homogenous example of things needing to be the same in order to use them. So typically for our mechanically recycling markets and uses, um, in order to recycle the plastics, they must be the same. They must be the same material. Uh, so all our number ones uh, need to go with number one. Uh, and we need to make sure that they don't have other uh, co-materials that go with them. So the polymer, the actual plastic type, uh, needs to be the same. And typically and historically in our recycling markets have all been thermoplastics. Uh, so we want to eliminate cross-plastic contamination, get them into a single, single form. Nor do we want non-polymer materials. So if it's not plastic, we don't want it. So you don't want multi-layers of plastic, you don't with an aluminized layer like our chip bags or our crisp bags or something like that nor do you want labels to come with your plastics. Uh, that would include cellulose or fiber, or you don't want any metals or, or anything like that as well. So no trace, uh, no or trace amount of non-polymer materials. And then the form needs to be the same. Since we're mechanically recycling it, we're, looking, we're interested in its mechanical properties and its mechanical integrity. So uh, mixing a, a clamshell with a, a bottle uh, it doesn't work as well. Uh, definitely not mixing a film with a rigid or a foam with a rigid. That doesn't work well at all. And then uh, we also want the colors to be the same. So we can have a nice homogenous uh, mixture and, and uh, product for reuse. You see, uh, I'll put a couple of examples of some flaked uh, recycled polymers. Uh, on the bottom, and that's kind of what you're looking for. All the size is the same, the color is generally the same for the most part, and uh, all the material has been, been sorted out. So there's many, many steps that we put in and a lot of uh, that costs quite a bit in order to segregate materials, clean them up, get them all to the sort of the same color, and as well as sorted to the same size. I've included a picture on the right this is a material that we actually accept here uh, where I'm located out, out here in Tigard, Oregon. Uh, and those are uh, ag trays. And you can see there's mold and, and residue, uh, fertilizer, 
soil, uh, you know, there's organic growth still in there. Uh, this would not be suitable for use in a mechanical recycling market. Uh, there's just too, too uh, many contamination uh, from, from its use, as well as uh, cross-contamination from other materials. So back to uh, the uh, fundamental understanding of post-use uh, plastics as a largely untapped resource. So this gets back to uh, what we fundamentally view is that since plastics came are basically uh, hydrocarbons, they're a hydrocarbon pool, so we can use hydrocarbon chemistry to uh, recover those materials. Whether that be the base stocks, as you see in the, the, the green there, uh, base chemical, chemical intermediates, uh, or you know, more, more user end products, uh, whether it's adhesives, fuels, uh, even dyes recovering those and other resins. But in order to do all of this, we truly need to understand the state of plastic, including all their complexity, so we know the best route and most effective route and efficient route to move forward. And it's a uh, quite a large market uh, from our estimate. This, since plastics are continually being used and produced, and if we're able to recycle them and recover them, put them back into the market, you can actually have a renewable hydrocarbon reserve uh, that from our estimates, you know, can be upwards of uh, $180 billion uh, worth of value annually. And this doesn't, and that's probably uh, short because I'm not including all of the plastic that we did, you know, mentioned previously into this analysis. So, how we came up with this number, uh, polystyrene is a $37 billion annual market from post-use plastics, what actually is turned into polymers that are addressable and recoverable, and then reintroducing those back into the market would be about 17 billion acrylics, about five olefins, which is your polypropylene, polyethylene base, is about 70 billion. Uh, PET, so your polyethylene terephthalate, 38 billion. And fuels, of course, is the largest global market, but the actual addressable market uh, from a plastics perspective would be about 50 billion. So it's quite a big opportunity if we're able to extract the value from plastic uh, from their disparate sources. So in viewing these as a, as a hydrocarbon reserve, it enables us to lay a foundation and forge a path for more efficient chemistries within a complex mixture. So I've, I've made a, a depiction of kind of what, how we view this working on the right. Um, so you, if you start at the top of the, the image where all, you have all your post-use plastics in various forms, uh, some of them have good mechanical recycling markets, most of them do not. Um, but basically we, understanding what those plastics are what the non-plastics are, as well as the other contaminations, enables us to generate a feedstock recipe and a suitable uh, chemical pathway to converting that back into to its resins again. Uh, some of them uh, are so contaminated that even in using the chemistry pathways, uh, that it's just more suitable for recovering the energy within those polymers. But these more circular supply chains and economies by returning the plastic hydrocarbon reserve back into its base stocks and intermediates as even specialty chemicals. Uh, just, it just makes for a more general elegant solution uh, to be possible and it can allow for better stewardship of materials overall. So this is kind of the crux of what we're aiming to do. And then taking all those complexities, I've kind of done a word map here so you can see, you know, you're able to deal with the more heterogeneous nature um, when you're looking at it from a hydrocarbon reserve perspective and a, and a chemistry perspective as opposed to just mechanical. So on the feed side, you have all of what goes into to plastics and polymers, including their post-use cross-contamination. You do need to prep it for, for uh, for processing, you have a more uh, sweeping tool set for 
actually taking those materials and then making valuable products again uh, with them. So uh, the same example that I showed earlier uh, that would not be suitable for mechanical recycling is actually very suitable for, uh, you know, what, what we refer to as chemical recycling or gathering its, its chemical or technical nutrients back into the supply chain. So the same Boston Consultancy Group uh, did a little summary in, in the recent publication, an overview of uh, some different types of chemical recycling and the processes that are available in the market or uh, are being developed in the market. Uh, Agilex uses pyrolysis, so uh, I will use this as an illustration of looking at plastics as a hydrocarbon reserve using pyrolysis, enabled, enabling to enhance those recycling rates uh, going forward. So from theory to practice, the Agilex solution. So to give you a little bit more background on the company, uh, it's 15 years, uh, 15 years old where we've really been spending our time understanding post-use polymers, their state, uh, the, what's, what's contained in them from a chemistry point of view, so we can actually uh, make valuable products again using, one, our technology platform, two, uh, we've really had to understand feedstock management, supply chain and logistics in order to, to feed our facilities, and then those two businesses are underpinned by our ongoing R&D data analytics and predictive modeling. But we believe we've built a, a unique and comprehensive platform in order to uh, use our technology suite to address this complexity issue of plastics recycling uh, from the lens of it's a hydrocarbon reserve. I'll give you a little more uh, real examples. This is uh, some images of the facility of where I'm located out here in Oregon. You can see we have we've have uh, disparate materials on the, the left-hand side, rigid, densified foams, films, all commingled together, uh, all in various, various colors, forms, uh, different levels of contamination, whether that's uh, coming from the agriculture industry or the life sciences, post-consumer, post-industrial, uh, it doesn't matter uh, to an extent we have been able to characterize and understand these materials for our process. We use pyrolysis uh, in order to depolymerize uh, the, the polymers back to their, their base constituents so we can put them back into the supply chain. Uh, we don't have catalysts in ours, so it can be a little bit more robust than others, uh, potential similar uh, technologies, but they, they each have their benefits. Um, with them as well. We recover our product and then uh, stabilize it and, and ship it to customers. So that example that, that I gave earlier of those ag trays, uh, those are currently being actually recycled here and uh, recycled in such a manner that they can be reused even in food contact or medical grade uh, materials again. So as we discussed uh, very briefly earlier, and I gave some allusion, allusion to there's multiple pathways when you start looking things at a hydrocarbon reserve. There's multiple products that that can be made. Uh, some polymers lend themselves to uh, depolymerization into their, their building blocks again, so it's easy to make uh, new polymers and new products again, and that is uh, polystyrene and styrene, your esters, so your PET, and your acrylics. Others, uh, they're, they're more suited for chemical-based stocks or intermediate, which can be building blocks for making polymers again. And then if a, if a material or source is so contaminated, uh, it's best used is for low carbon fuels. Uh, I can give it more insight into this. Uh, the market's been very receptive of this kind of viewpoint. Uh, the facility that we had built in 2013 is now a joint venture as of 20, uh, 2019 last year uh, and is now a circular solution for polystyrene uh, here in Oregon. So it's a, I provide here a better image. You can see the 
compactness of our system uh, here that's uh, currently operating and uh, depolymerizing polystyrene back into its monomer styrene to make polystyrene again. Uh, we get quite a bit of feedstock as well. You can see quite the various natures and, and just different angles. But I can discuss that uh, a little bit more uh, as well. So really uh, the whole goal of looking at these as a hydrocarbon reserve is that it does enable and promote circular supply chains. So instead of going to landfill or incineration or other fuels, uh, it does enable polymers and all of these materials to be put back into the supply chain, dealing with the complex heterogeneous nature of post-use and being able to um, use them again. And all of this is done um, in, a, in an environmental stewardship fashion. So these circular supply chains um, from a complexity point of view and even in a recycling point of view are done with 50% up to 50% lower carbon intensity, up to 80% lower greenhouse gases, um, makes those single use packaging uh, be able to be considered multi-use or polyusable and uh, recycles indefinitely in principle, you do have yield losses, but it makes materials able to stay at their highest and best use for as long as possible. And even if you do go to, to fuels uh, using this method, it is a better environmental and carbon footprint as well. Okay. Um, I'll, we're reaching the end of my, my time here, but uh, hopefully I give you an indication of that it is possible uh, to, to increase our recycling rates dramatically when we open up our view and our perspective of what plastics are and how to handle them, not necessarily try to manipulate them uh, and reduce them in scope so we can only capture a few percentage uh, for mechanical recycling rates, but also increase that to looking at its chemistry and chemical nature uh, from how we made them to begin with and then make uh, more robust recycling loops to increase that like re recapture and recovery rate to the 90% plus. Okay, so I'd invite you all to, to join us as we create new lives for post-use plastics, reduce pollution, and create a responsible, more circular and low carbon product pathways. So I appreciate your attention and uh, I'll give kudos to the rest of the team here that, that has done most of the work. I just get the, the benefit of of explaining and, and presenting to the world what the work they do. Well, thank you, Dr. Faulkner. Uh, we do have some questions here and uh, we, we do have some time for additional questions. If anybody, anybody thinks of any questions here as we're discussing these first few, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box um, on, the, uh, on the Zoom client. So uh, a couple of general questions first. Um, so how are you, how are you um, where do you procure your feedstock from? Are you dealing with local municipalities? Are you dealing with predominantly, what, what's the ratio on post-consumer versus post-industrial? Um, can you give us any insight into, into where you're getting the material from? Sure, uh, it depends on, on the product pathway, but predominantly uh, material we receive here in Oregon is post-commercial or post-use. We don't get much post-industrial and manufacturing scrap, um, but we get a lot from the agriculture industry post-use. Um, you can, you know, it's not packaging per se, but it's post-industrial use. And we get a lot of shipments uh, that are used for, for shipping materials and goods here in Oregon. But it, we take it all. Um, so we get a lar large spread. We have uh, interactions with municipalities. Uh, there's a public drop-off that we have here at our facility. In fact, while we were, we were talking here, I watched 10 cars pull up and drop off material uh, here at our bins. Uh, so we, we have contracts and uh, feedstock supply agreement with about 500 entities um, here in Tigard, but uh, 
it, it just ranges. Thank you. Um, and, and again, staying on a, a more general level, um, how prevalent is this sort of technology? Uh, are there other companies in the space? Um, how, how um, can you guesstimate a, a very rough percentage on uh, what percentage of, of post-consumer waste you guys are, are processing this way versus the traditional method? Are we talking about a fraction of a percent just because the technology hasn't hasn't um, fully been implemented, uh, you know, nationwide. What, what's what are the barriers to, to getting this um, more in use throughout the country? Sure, I'll try try to attempt to to answer those few questions. Um, there's quite a lot to unpack there. Uh, barriers to entry is is really just starting to promote and and give these uh, facilities, uh, whether they're depolymerization or not, uh, time to grow and deploy. Uh, they are chemical manufacturing facilities, uh, so those take some time to develop and deploy into this, to the market. Uh, regarding the percentage of post-consumer versus others, uh, currently that percentage is low as this is a maturing uh, segment and manufacturing um, supply chain and industry, uh, the business-to-business -business relationships form much faster uh, than business-to-government. Uh, uh, relationships. So, uh, I'd say percentage-wise, you're, you're probably 10% post-consumer from a residential point of view, and that's because most of our uh, recycling assets that are deployed, at least in the U.S., uh, you have local, it's a very local issue. Uh, what's allowed in the recycling bin is only what can be recycled currently, not what can be recycled in the future. And uh, most of our recycling assets and material recovery assets uh, started out as paper and uh, metals, in some cases glass recovery, and plastics recovery has been slow uh, to be added to that to that suite. So the example I would give is here in in Oregon, uh, polystyrene is not one of the accepted materials in our bin. Uh, so even though we have a recycling facility. In, in the state that can accept those materials, the hauling contracts are, are existing and have been in place uh, and would need to be uh, modified in, in proposals going forward in order to, to include the municipal assets in current MERS receiving that material. So there's quite a bit of work uh, to do to engage that supply chain. Thank you very much. I do have a couple of uh, cleanliness uh, uh, related questions. So can highly degraded plastics and contaminated, uh, for example, litter, marine debris, cleanup material, can that be used as feedstock for fuel creation? Is, is, is it, fuel creation kind of the, the lowest common denominator? Fuel, fuel creation is, uh, that can take usually the dirtiest of, of the dirty. Uh, decomposed plastics and polymers, it's not necessarily the the partially decomposed plastics that are the issue, it's more of a mass balance. So when you do reclamation activities, the amount of actual hydrocarbon recovering, uh, recovered and collected per pound of what's processed is usually only about 50%. So your recovery of fuels or products is going to be reflected uh, accordingly. Fantastic. Um, wow, we have a bun bunch of questions come in now. So here we go. Um, of all the material received, what amount goes to each of the three pathways? Are they, how profitable are they in relation to each other? Is one more desirable than the other? Yeah, so, so the analogous, you know, the analogy that I've been using throughout the webinar today is if you look at plastics as a hydrocarbon reserve and you look at the traditional uh, history of the petrochem industry, we started out using oil as fuel, you know, that's the, and we still use a lot of it as fuel today. And then as we went through and developed the uh, technology and advanced in material science uh, using hydrocarbons, we started getting into plastics and specialty chemicals. So on that slide from left to right uh, is, is the value proposition, right? The more mature or specialized the, the chemistry or monomer or the chemical that you can, can create, the more value there is for that with fuels being, being the bottom. 
Okay. Can, can uh, Agilix handle non-petroleum based feedstocks like bioplastics? So bioplastics uh, are actually, it's still a hydrocarbon. All right, so, so the answer is yes. It's still a hydrocarbon reserve in our viewpoint. Uh, talking about the energy return, what is the energy return on the processes? Does it take more energy to produce plastics this way than to extract virgin material? Uh, so uh, that's going to be related to the environmental stewardship. So uh, any recycling is, is going to be more favorable than generating new. Uh, it depends on the oil source. You know, tar sands is quite uh, energy expensive to extract the hydrocarbon out of. Uh, but some of the oil wells in like Saudi Arabia, uh, you just stick a pipe in the ground, it almost spews up. So it doesn't quite take as much energy to recover or to extract oil from that well. But regardless, overall, on average, recycling is going to be better and envir more environmentally favorable. And that uh, shows up in the lower greenhouse gases in the life cycle analyses, uh, up to 80% lower, lower impact. Um, and similarly, that means that you're also using that much less energy as well. Right. What are, what are the waste products um, that you guys encounter? Once your process is done and you've pulled the, the uh, hydrocarbons out of there, what's, what's left over that you guys can't use? Yeah, so this is, uh, goes into the integrated nature uh, of where projects are deployed. So uh, since we're taking, uh, and it depends on feedstock quality of what non-plastics are there. So if we're taking in non-plastics, we're not gonna produce uh, a valuable hydrocarbon from that. But assuming that, that all of our feedstock is, is a plastic or polymer, uh, for our process at Agilex, uh, depending on, it will also depend on the product pathway. So for polystyrene, for example, uh, at our facility here, it's up to 75% efficient at recovering uh, styrene back out. You do have some light hydrocarbons, um, that come out of that as well, that can either be used for fuel. If you're next to an, a chemical manufacturer, there is chemical value in a gas stream that, that we produce. Um, and then the remainder of that is gonna be a char, which is a, a solid carbon. So you have three, three products for uh, Agilix's process. You have the actual hydrocarbon or monomer or chemical that you're producing. Um, and then you have a gas component that can be used as uh, chemical um, chemicals for manufacturing as well. If you have the facilities, if you don't, then that's going to be a, about 10 to 20 percent, depending on the pathway for fuel value for heating the process. And then you'll have five to 10 percent uh, solid char. Uh, that's a byproduct of, of pyrolysis. And that amount of char depends on the amount of fillers that are put into the plastic to begin with. Uh, okay. Um, in, in the Midwest, the mechanical recycling market is strong. Natural HDPE has eclipsed aluminum can recycling for a number of months. Uh, the, the, question, the attendee says, we see a push for MRFs accepting non-recyclable residential plastics, which is problematic. Is Agilix mm -hmm. developing a residential feedstock infrastructure to collect plastics that are not acceptable in the mechanical recycling world? <laughs> Uh, the answer, the short answer is yes, um, uh, but it takes quite a bit of infrastructure and work to do that. Uh, if you're not collecting it with the other polymers, um, you know, then you're going to have to develop a separate logistics supply chain and that can be uh, costly if not implemented well. But what we have found is that in, you know, in viewing all of them as a hydrocarbon reserve, wanting them to be used for the highest and best use, if there's a mechanical recycling outlet, Let's use it. That market exists, it's established, and there's a demand for that. For all these undesired plastics or uh, currently not recycled, um, they need to go along, along the ride too. But if you collect all the plastic and you create these uh, um, mini hydrocarbon wells, so to speak, it'll reduce the cost of collection and recycling and feedstock aggregation uh, for all plastics. Right. Since we're so specific and selective, you get a lot of contamination issues currently 
uh, that if you, if, you know, as we retrofit and start to look at these as having uh, value going forward, we're able to process those into recipes that make sense. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of uh, related questions here. Um, is there any issue with um, food waste being uh, food residue remaining on the EPS products? Uh, or e yeah, EPS products. And are similarly, um, are there any forms or polymers that are limiting in your processes or will you accept um, any polymer if they're clean enough? Yeah, so uh, food waste is not an issue from a processing standpoint. Uh, it does not produce uh, good oil in our process, so we limit it just from a throughput. We don't want to heat it up uh, just to create char uh, for, for use, but residual foods and imputressible and organic is no issue. You saw those, those ag trays as an example um, for our polystyrene train. Uh, polyolefin train is the same. You know, the system can handle it. Uh, it's not an issue there. Um, so, uh, sorry, Scott, what was the last portion of hey, that? Are, are, there, are there any, are, do you accept all polymers um, if they're clean enough? Yeah, so um, all polymers to an extent. So since we chemically profile, uh, then we would make a, a product pathway that's suitable. So uh, your polyamides or your nylons are going to depolymerize and produce products that may not be suitable for olefin production. They're likely not going to be. So uh, yes, we would take all polymers and the process is robust enough to handle uh, certain, a higher level of cross-contamination, but we would aim to set those to uh, the chemical pathway that, that those polymers are preferred. For example, uh, styrene, it's highest and best use, or polystyrene is to go back to you styrene monomer. The polyolefins are useful for naphtha production, base stocks, oils, waxes, and even, even fuels. Um, PET and polyesters, whether it's fiber, bottle, clamshell, or otherwise, uh, is useful for the production of esters again. You know, so, so really we categorize uh, the polymers on, a, on its chemical fingerprint uh, as opposed to its mechanical fingerprint. Uh, I have a question, uh, an attendee has a question about, um, you, you list a 50% number and an 80% number a couple slides before the end. Is it possible to go back through there mm -hmm. so we can look at that? Okay, so, yep. so the wants to know what, what those percentages are compared against. So those are, uh, again, traditional manufacturing methods. So uh, whether that's taking the, the oil from the tar sands or, or the the deep oil well, uh, cleaning that up, cracking it, cleaning it again, and then producing the base chemicals to produce those polymers uh, versus taking uh, the polymer already produced and then depolymerizing it back to the, the monomer um, is a much more straightforward fashion and a, a more elegant chemistry pathway. All right, and then the uh, last question we have, um, what, what sort of um, legislative or regulatory changes are either in place or in works? What sort of stuff is going on to help encourage this sort of recycling um, to, to attempt to grow its use as opposed, in, in addition to the traditional mechanical ways? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. There's quite a few of uh, initiatives around around the world in that aspect. Uh, one that is being um, uh, drafted and pushed in, uh, and discussed is this idea of uh, mass balance or molecule accounting uh, for recycled content. So recycling and recyclability is predominantly uh, uh, a marketing term. Um, as opposed to whether something it can technically be recycled. And it's an access term for the general population. Um, so uh, addressing those types of terms and ability to, to account for actual recycled content 
uh, beyond just what we have historically looked at as mechanical recycling uh, is being uh, discussed and addressed, I think will open up avenues and markets for, for these types of technologies, including ours here at Agilex. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other is, is just uh, considerations which will come from that previous discussion of what is recyclable and what is recycled. Uh, and what counts as diversion from landfill or incineration and expanding the view of what is highest and best use of, of recycling uh, at large. So I know many of those discussions are happening uh, or a part of some of those and I know uh, some of the attendees are probably a part of those as well um, and that will definitely help promote and educate the broader public about the potential uses and uh, recyclability of materials. All right, well, uh, thank you again, Dr. Faulkner. Um, I know I learned a lot. I hope the attendees, um, we got one last question here. We're gonna squeeze them in right at the deadline. Uh, is anyone doing this process on the East Coast that you are aware of and would share? Uh, we, we have, um, on the East Coast, there were some uh, several years ago. I don't know if those were are still operational. Uh, we are developing a, a facility um, actually in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we started that in 2014 um, and had some readjustments and we're re-kicking that off uh, this year again. Uh, but that facility is not up and running. It's more in the design phase currently. Um, but I'm not familiar of any active uh, chemical recycling plants. Uh, there's, of course, waste to energy on the East Coast, and those have been on operation for quite some time. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any to date. All right. Well, thanks again for your time. And uh, again, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center's websites. Thanks again for joining us. We we'll hope you will join us next month for the next month's webinar. Please visit the NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates. Thank you everyone, have a great day.